So this is the pre-class video for naming and writing formulas for chemical compounds. So there are several different kinds of compounds that we need to be able to name and be able to write chemical formulas for. And acids are one of those categories. And we need to be able to pick out any acids in this list. Well, it's really nice if you're given the name for an acid because it's always going to have acid in the name. So hydrobromic acid is an acid. The other way that you can tell what acids are, the most common way at least, is that acids are going to tend to start with hydrogen in the front of their formulas. The other kind of compounds that we need to be able to identify are ionic compounds. And so ionic compounds are always going to contain ions in them. So NH4Cl, ammonium chloride is really nice because ammonium, NH4, you should recognize as a polyatomic ion. And anytime that you see a polyatomic ion in a compound, that's always going to be an ionic compound. The other way you can tell ionic compounds, especially ones that don't have ammonium in them, is they tend to have, they tend to have a metal and a nonmetal in combination. So calcium bromide is another ionic compound. The third class of compounds that we need to be able to identify are binary molecular compounds. And these are always going to be two elements, and those are always going to be nonmetals. And so CO2 is two nonmetals, and sulfur trioxide is two nonmetals. Now occasionally, as we'll see later on, there might be polyatomic ions that have little prefixes like di and tri. And so you may want to be careful. You don't necessarily want to look and see if there's a prefix in the name to be able to determine if it's an ionic compound or a binary molecular compound. So let's start with naming of ionic compounds. And every ionic compound is going to be a cation first. and an anion second. And that's also how, going to be how we name them. So NaCl, a very common compound for all of us. The Na is sodium, and the Cl is chloride. And so the cation name is the same as the name of the metal, or the same as the name of the element itself. This is not supposed to be capitalized. Names are always lowercase unless you have them at the start of a sentence. And then it's only the first part of the name. So with sodium chloride, the name of the element is sodium. The name of the cation is sodium. The name of the nonmetal is chlorine. But we change that I-N-E ending to an I-D-E ending in an ionic compound. We also have compounds like CaCl2. The name for Ca now is calcium. And the second part is chloride. We don't worry about trying to show how many of the atoms are in an ionic compound. One exception to this might be for polyatomic ions which have specific names so Na2Cr2O7 Cr2O7 is called the dichromate ion so that's the name of that anion and sodium would be the first part but we don't try to say that there are somehow two sodiums here we ignore that that's going to be taken care of by the charges. Another consideration with ionic compounds is when you have metals that have multiple charges. The metals you need to know for this class are iron, copper, nickel, tin, and lead. Now these have old names or Latin names and the Latin names are ferrum, cuprum, stanum, and plumbum.
Nickel doesn't have a Latin name, so we're not going to worry about that one. These also have two possible charges that we're going to consider in this class. They could have a low or a high charge. Iron can be 2 plus or 3 plus. Copper can be 1 plus or 2 plus. Nickel can be 2 plus or 3 plus. Tin can be 2 plus or 4 plus. And lead can be 2 plus or 4 plus. So when you're naming these in compounds, you have to name the cation, which means the name of the cation is going to contain the charge. So the names of these two compounds are iron 2 chloride or iron 3 chloride. You could also call them ferrous chloride or ferric chloride. And you may be saying, how do you know what the charge is? Well, if the charge on chloride is 1 minus, and there are three chlorides, this compound has to always have a neutral charge. And so the three chlorides give you negative three, x minus three equals zero. So x equals positive three or three plus. So that's where the iron 3 comes from for the name. Go ahead and name these compounds. And pause the video. Last chance to pause. So this is calcium bromide, lead, four, or plumbic oxide, and sodium sulfate. So you may be saying, well, when do you need to use the Roman numerals? And the short story is that you need to use the Roman numerals for every metal that is not in group one, group two, or is not aluminum, zinc, or silver. So all group 1 metals will always have charges of 1 plus. All group 2 metals will always have charges of 2 plus. Aluminum will always have a charge of 3 plus. Zinc will always have a charge of 2 plus. And silver nearly always will have a charge of 1 plus. So at least for 1211 we're not going to worry about other charges. When can you use the ick and the us endings? Us is the lower charge. Ick is the higher charge. You can use those whenever you happen to know that there's only two possible charges. So the only situations in this class where you could choose to use those or where you need to be able to read a chemical name using those is with the metals given in this list. If the metal doesn't have a Latin name like nickel, then you just use the current name, the English name, and you append the suffix. So Nicholas or Nicolic would be the appropriate names with the old or the classical system using these suffixes.
the current or the modern stock naming system uses the Roman numerals. This means that if we're given names of compounds like nickel 3 sulfide or nickel 3 sulfite, we should be able to turn these names into a chemical formula. So we're going to start by writing down the ion with its charge. This means you need to know what the sulfide ion is. This also means you need to know what the sulfite ion is, and we'll come back to that after we do these two formulas. So once you have the cation and the anion written down with their charges, then you need to think, okay, how do I balance those charges? So the sum of all of the charges always has to equal zero. So one way you can look at this is you can think about crossing these charges. So the two minus on the sulfur means you have two nickels. The three plus on the nickel means you have three sulfides. Likewise, with the polyatomic ion. Now, showing this as Ni2S3 is perfectly fine, but you wouldn't want to write Ni2SO33 because that's going to make it look like there's 33 oxygens. So instead of showing it like there's 33 oxygens, you instead use parentheses. So you would put parentheses around that polyatomic ion that you're trying to say that there are three of. Now with polyatomic ions, you need to have these memorized, and there's a list on D2L for you to memorize. But in general, there's a pattern here where you can see as the number of oxygens in the polyatomic ion goes up or goes down, the name changes. So per chlorate, chlorate, chlorite and hypochlorite. Now these are kind of like hyper and hypo, like hypertonic and hypotonic, where hypo means very low and hyper means very high. And then the 8 is always going to mean more, and the it is always going to mean less. So if you're comparing nitrate and nitrite, you know the nitrate needs to have more oxygens than the nitrite. However, whenever you're looking at these polyatomic ions and they're based on the same sets of elements, they're always going to end up having the same charges no matter how many oxygens are in that polyatomic ion. So you need to make sure you have these polyatomic ions memorized. Now acids kind of relate to ionic compounds because acids are going to react with water to produce ions in solution. And so those acids are going to be named based on the ions they generate in solution. So HNO3, which de generates nitrate in solution, is going to be named based on the nitrate ion. Now that nitrate isn't necessarily in the HNO3. It's not a nitrate ion there by itself. This is a covalent compound. This is a molecule, not an ionic compound. But because it produces the nitrate ion when it reacts with water, we're actually going to change this ending from A-T-E to ic, so this becomes nitric acid. Likewise, if you had something like, say, H2SO4 reacting with water, This is going to make the sulfate ion because sulfate is based on sulfur that UR gets added back in. That ATE still turns into IC 
So this is now sulfuric acid. How do you think is, this is going to be different for HNO2 or H2SO3? So the NO2 has less oxygen than the nitrate. The SO3 has less oxygen than the sulfate. So these ions are, of course, nitrite and sulfite. So when these become acids, when those ions are formed from these compounds, when these compounds react with water, if the ion that's formed is nitrite, that means the acid is going to be nit something acid, and the sulfite is going to be sulfur something acid. What do you think that suffix is if the nitrate became nitric acid and the sulfate became sulfuric acid? The nitrite has less oxygen. What meant less? Us meant less. So nitrous acid or sulfurous acid. The first one there was HCl. HCl is a little unique in that it's going to make chloride in solution, which is not a polyatomic ion. This is going to be chloride. We can't just change this to ick, because then chloric acid would technically be HClO3. So how are we going to specify that this is a monatomic ion? Even though it's still going to go from IDE to ick, this means that because it's monatomic, we're going to put hydro in front of the name. So this becomes hydrochloric acid. So what would the chemical formulas be for compounds like hydrobromic acid or hypobromous acid? Well, the hydro here is telling us that it's monatomic. So that bromic is actually based on bromide. Bromide would be Br with a minus charge, a negative charge. If we are adding H in with this to make it an acid, if that H is bonding with the bromine, then because it's a negative one charge, it only takes one H to balance out that charge. Going back and looking at something like sulfite, sulfite normally would have a two minus charge which was why it took two hydrogens to balance that charge. Sulfate has a two minus charge, which was why sulfuric acid had two hydrogens. How about hypobromous acid? Well, there's no hydro here, so this is based on a polyatomic ion. So hypobromite is BRO. And just like the chlorine oxyanions, this only has a one minus charge as an ion. So as an acid, there's only one H there. The final topic is binary molecular compounds and we worry about the prefixes for one through 10 with these from mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nana, and deca. And simply, any compound which has two nonmetals in it is going to be named using these prefixes. So CO2, there's only one carbon, so mono, carbon, Two oxygens means it's dioxide. Again, we do change that ending to IDE when it's part of a compound. And we typically forget about writing mono if it's on the first element. However, that is required on the second element. So carbon monoxide. So what would the names using these prefixes be? for these compounds.
the H2O would be dihydrogen monoxide and H3 would be nitrogen trihydrogen we should change the ending to IDE that's going to make this hydride and diphosphorus pentoxide even though the prefix is penta if it's followed by another vowel you can choose to drop that a so what should the names be for what should the formulas be for dinitrogen tetraoxide again you might see that with no a and what should the formula be for triuranium oct oxide So dinitrogen means N2, tetraoxide means O4, triuranium means U3, octoxide means O8. If these were binary molecular compounds, that's what they would be called. That's how the naming and the writing of the formulas would work. Now, you might see some compounds which will combine these systems. And these would be hydrated compounds. And you might see this with hydrated compounds because of how they crystallize. So if you crystallize ionic compounds from aqueous solutions, often they may contain water trapped within the crystal lattice. And so you're going to name these as though it's an ionic compound. So CuSO4, well that's copper sulfate. Is that complete for that name? No, because it's copper we have to specify the charge. The charge on sulfate is 2 minus. That means the charge on copper is 2 plus. So we've got the ionic part named, and then we're going to name the water part. Well, this is really easy because this is a hydrated salt. It's going to be a hydrate. So copper 2 sulfate hydrate. We need to say how many waters are trapped in that crystal. This is where those prefixes are going to come into play, and we would say pentahydrate. So what would CaCl2.2H2O be? This is calcium chloride dihydrate. And why is it not necessarily to specify charge with the calcium? Because calcium is a group 2 metal, it's always going to be 2 plus in compounds. Finally, with organic compounds, the prefixes change by a little bit for 1 through 4, but are the same after these. Etc. And we're simply going to look at these to be able to identify for organic molecules how many carbons are in the compound. So this has five carbons. So it's going to be pent something. If it's all single bonds like it is now, then it's pentane. If it's got a double bond anywhere, then we would call it pentene. And if it's got a triple bond, then we would call it pentine. So ane means all single bonds. between carbons, 
pentene means that there's at least one double bond. between carbons and pentine means that there is at least one triple bond between carbons. So if I say propane, you should recognize that that's got three carbons for propane. If I say butene you should recognize that's got four carbons and there's a double bond somewhere in that compound for now it doesn't really matter where we would put it really with these with organic you're just gonna have to be able to look at them and name them based on the formula that you see specifying how many carbons up through ten and whether it's all singles or whether there's a double or a triple bond somewhere in the structure.